All right, welcome back to another episode of Creedal Theology and Culture. I am very excited to be joined today by Andrew Pettiprin, who is a fellow of popular culture at the Word on Fire Institute and an author and former Anglican cleric who was received into the Catholic Church on January 1st, 2019. So it's been about a year and a half since Andrew uh, became Catholic. He earned an MDiv from Yale University and a MPhil, Master of Philosophy, from Oxford University, where he was a Marshall Scholar. And this is his first time on the show. I'm very excited. We talked about a month ago about some of the things that we could talk about, and we have uh, some future work coming up that we're excited to announce. We'll talk about that more at the end. But Andrew, welcome to Creedal. Glad to be with you, Zach. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you. Uh, I remember reading your name several years ago, uh, probably actually around two years ago, maybe two and a half, when you were writing that you were becoming Catholic uh, or that you'd recently become Catholic. And I thought just what a cool story. And as you know, I'm a former Anglican myself. I was uh, was baptized and confirmed in the Episcopal Church, um, which at the time was uh, uh, you know, part of the Anglican Communion. I'm actually not sure what the status right now is of the Episcopal Church in the United States of America. Uh, there, there are at least some irregularities, I think, there with sort of how, how, how fully it is in communion with other aspects of the Anglican Church around the world. But I was really uh, struck by that part of your story and thought that that would be a good starting point for our discussion. So uh, you were an Episcopal priest. Where did you do your ministry? Yeah, well, thanks, Zach. I, I, I appreciate our common, uh, our common yeah. background as well. And uh, as you well know, we're, we're far from alone. There are a lot, of, a lot of people who have made the journey into full communion with the Catholic Church. Uh, either from Anglicanism originally or by way of Anglicanism from some other Protestant background or right. maybe non-religious background. And I should say that was my story. I mean, not really me personally, but, but my, uh, you know, I was in the Episcopal Church, not because I was a cradle Episcopalian, but because my parents had been, had come to Christ in the Baptist Church and then were Presbyterian by the time I was born. Um, and then when I was young, became Episcopalian. Uh, they they still remain Anglican. Or my 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 mom has passed away. My dad still remains Anglican. He's an Anglican priest, in fact. Uh, but that was their journey, right? And so mine just sort of continued from there, and I eventually became Catholic. Yeah, Anglicanism uh, sort of made sense for me in similar re- for similar reasons. My my father was a Presbyterian kind of mainline Protestant sort of person. My mother was a Southern Baptist and very much involved in the Charismatic movement when it oh, kind wow. of came around and everything. And uh, but also um, somewhere along the line had been an Episcopalian and she and her parents and her siblings all came into the Episcopal Church. And so when my mom and dad uh, got got married, um, they tended to go to Methodist churches, Presbyterian churches, that sort of thing. Episcopal churches were, were too Catholic seeming for my dad. Yeah. Um, so but then in the 90s, we kind of got involved in the mega church movement, kind of the, the charismatic non-denominational oh, movement. Yeah. Yeah. So my my background is is uh, is very uh, is very diverse in the in the Protestant spectrum, um, and it was actually when I was studying in England uh, when I arrived there in two thousand and one that I became an Anglican. But again, because of my mother's background and and all of that sort of thing, it was always something I knew about. We had prayer books in our home and that sort of thing, and so for me it was a very natural next step in my kind of spiritual development. And uh, I was an Anglican for uh, almost two decades, I, for, well, for 16, 17 years. And for about nine of those years, I was ordained. I was an, or, I was an ordained Episcopal priest. Mm-hmm. And uh, I ministered in, in diverse uh, situations. I was ordained out in Arizona, and then I came back to Florida, to Central Florida, where I was uh, originally from. And I was uh, the pastor of a congregation there for about six and a half years. Okay. And then I went to Nashville, Tennessee, where I was on the bishop's staff there. And it was at that, it was at that time that uh, my family and I were received in the, into the Catholic Church. And, uh, you know, for me, at that, at that time, it was, um, it, there was a lot of clarity during that period of my life. When I was ministering in a congregation, it was just easy to kind of keep my head down. I was, I was always bothered by certain things that were going on in the Episcopal Church, and, and there was always this sort of longing within me for this fullness of faith that I sort of knew deep down underneath was really uh, the, the property of the Roman Catholic Church. But it wasn't until I got out of parish ministry and I was working in a, in a more kind of administrative role that I was able to see the landscape better, and just providentially people came into my life who helped me um, just kind of figure out where, where it was all heading. Yeah, that makes sense. What were some of the, uh, I guess, some of the catalysts for your decision there? I mean, when you, as you were ministering as an Anglican cleric, 
What were some of the things that you would think about on a regular basis that were either sort of pushing you away from Anglicanism or drawing you to Catholicism? Well, quite a few things. You know, uh, even well before I went away to train for ordination in the Episcopal Church, I was kind of haunted by this idea that maybe I should be Roman Catholic. And that seed was planted largely uh, upon the death of Pope St. John Paul II. Uh, I remember really strongly just kind of just feeling overwhelmed by that event and just watching the watching the funeral and watching Pope Benedict become the Pope and, and just sort of becoming more and more enamored with him and, and learning more about uh, about Pope Benedict and coming to appreciate John Paul II. So, you know, there was actually a moment of crisis uh, a few years before I was ordaining the Episcopal Church, just kind of wondering about that. But, you know, as, as a lot of people, especially uh, Anglican clerics, will be able to tell you, there are, you know, you have these moments where you're sort of really concerned and wondering about things, and then you kind of come through it. You you talk to somebody who sort of like helps you kind of see, well, you know, no, it's not time to jump ship now. And, you know, I mean, there are just all kinds of ways to rationalize not becoming Catholic. Uh, and, and therefore, when the moment actually comes to become Catholic, to come into full communion, the only way that I can describe it is just as an inexplicable work of grace, because there are all these sort of intellectual things that are going on year in and year out. Uh, but then it is ultimately something pretty mysterious that results in that final, that final push. But, you know, throughout the years, I, I sort of agonized over, well, you know, it seems like the Episcopal Church is going off in the wrong direction in a whole lot of different ways. And, you know, what is that going to mean for me? For a while, I really bought into the idea that there you could be a kind of faithful witness. You could be a kind of remnant of something true and, and good inside this structure that seemed to be just completely falling apart. And that there was even maybe an ecumenical vocation to stay put and to kind of keep talking to to the Orthodox, to Roman Catholics, to other Protestants in this grand vision, maybe of reunion one day. But what happened was in around 2017, when I moved to Nashville, several things happened. But one of the most important things was I joined this ecumenical reading group with a group of Anglicans and a group of Roman Catholics, including a couple of Dominican nuns. Um, and also were they, uh, were they the, the Nashville Dominicans? Indeed, they were two yeah. of the famous oh, Nashville great. Dominicans. Yeah. And, you know, they just had this way, Zach, that I, I had never really encountered Roman Catholics like these women and like the other Roman Catholics who were in this group. I mean, they were kind and generous. They were theologically very, very sophisticated and astute. And they articulated for the first time that I had ever heard, or at least that I had ever paid attention to, the idea that I wasn't nothing as an Anglican, but that but that I wasn't everything. And that in fact, I had gifts that I could bring into the Catholic Church and that the Catholic Church was kind of rooting me on and cheering for me. And I discovered in these people willing to do anything for me to, to help me figure out how to come in and be a part of the fullness of faith with my family. So that was just extremely formative. In that reading group, we read John Paul II's um, document on ecumenism, Ut Unum Sint, which it's really funny because I had read that as an Anglican a few years before that, and my reading of it, because I had read it with other Anglicans and some very, very smart Anglicans, was my reading was that basically John Paul II was saying, it's okay not to be Catholic, and you know, and you can just kind of stay put. Right, right. But reading it with these Catholics, I came away with, with a very different impression. Namely, this this view that I'm, I've already said that, you know, that that non-Catholics had gifts to share, that we were separated brethren, that we weren't yeah. nothing, but that there was this incredible outpouring of grace that was going on in the world that was actually moving people towards communion. And the subtext of the whole thing was that communion means communion with the Vicar of Christ, with the Pope. Right. And once I kind of wrapped my mind around that, that idea, I, it was the train couldn't be stopped. And uh, my family and I uh, just decided to to go ahead and go for it and come into full communion. Now, on the topic of communion, was the doctrine of the real presence a stumbling block for you at all as you were coming into the church? Or was it maybe a motivator for your entrance into the church? Um, it was it was a motivator, though I have to say I had been when I was when I was at Oxford, I had uh, come into the Church of England uh, by way of a very high church. Yeah. Uh, setting, you know, and a high church group of friends. In fact, my friends, some of them are, are Anglican clerics, clerics back in England. Um, and they really articulated for me the idea that 
to become an Anglican was to become a Catholic and that you could you could believe in the real presence. You could even use words like transubstantiation if you right. wanted to, yeah. <laughs> um, which is very funny because, of course, in the, the 39 Articles of Religion. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to look that the, up actually right now because I was going to bring that up. But yeah, go ahead. I mean, yeah, we you, can go uh, further with that idea. But I mean, that that's that was clearly a major line of division right between yeah. Uh, you know, ultimately the, the, the Church of England's Protestant uh, past and this Catholic vision that, that many people in, in, uh, within Anglicanism had been striving for for some time. Uh, but yeah, when it, was finally, when it was finally the moment to, when, when this, this work of grace kind of had kind of come to fruition, I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to really receive the body, blood, soul, and yeah. divinity of Jesus Christ. You know, again, as an Episcopal priest, I, I had to I had to have some clarity in in believing that what I was doing at, at the altar, you know, uh, which is what the word that we used, that it wasn't nothing, that I wasn't giving my people poison, mm -hmm. um, but it, it was some kind of like some kind of manna, you know, it was some kind of like food that 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 was it, it had some some sustenance to it, uh, but it was not the real presence of Jesus. It wasn't the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. And so, you know, now as a Catholic, I'm still just, just in awe and blown away that I get to partake of, of our Lord every time, um, every time I, I'm, I'm present for uh, the sacrifice of the Mass. Oh, I know it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, I, I like your description of it, sort of as as something that is uh, something that at least signifies, right? So, in that sense, perhaps we can say that the the Protestant communion is a is a sacramental, right? It's a it's some sort of it's some sort of sacred sign that points to something and that helps helps people elevate their minds to something. But it is not the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We can say that definitively because of the nature of the sacrament and the holy orders that it requires to validly confect the Eucharist, etc. Um, but yeah, I did want to bring up the 39 articles, which you mentioned, and this has been a frustration of mine, or it was a frustration of mine when I was Anglican because um, I. I you, it's very difficult to pin down an Anglican on what exactly he believes vis-a-vis -vis the next Anglican in line because it's such a big tent, uh, which some have, suggest, some, some have suggested to me is actually a virtue of Anglicanism, right? That it's, it is such a big tent and that everybody can, can, can sup together at the Lord's table and believe many different things. Um, but there's no, you know, I think the line is unity in essentials and diversity in non-essentials. But the problem is that there's no uh, unity on agree, unity of agreement on what the essentials are. And so That's you right. quickly sort of break down from that. And so when I was thinking about becoming Catholic, um, you know, I'd, Anglicans talk to me and say, uh, what are the main motivations? What, what, is, what is it that you see? And one of the biggest ones for me was the Eucharist. And one Catholic in particular, one Anglican in particular, who's a cleric, uh, said to me, well, you can believe that and still be Anglican. Um, and I was like, well, first of all, let's, let's talk about the 39 articles, right? <laughs> you can't, uh, if you're following the 39 articles, which is the historic creedal expression of Anglicanism. Um, and I'm reading right here from article, uh, let's see, article 28 of the 39 articles. Uh, the supper of the Lord is not only a sign of love that Christians ought to have among themselves one to another, but rather it is a sacrament of our redemption by Christ's death insomuch that to such as rightly, worthily, and with faith receive the same, the bread which we break is a partaking of the body of Christ, and likewise the cup of blessing is a partaking of the blood of Christ. So there's certainly some real presence there, right? There's an idea of the real presence that is not the same thing that we describe as transubstantiation, and that is clear in the next line, which says, transubstantiation, or the change of the substance of bread and wine in the supper of the Lord, cannot be proved by holy writ, which is holy scripture, but is repugnant to the plain words of scripture, overthroweth the nature of a sacrament and hath given occasion to many superstitions. Right. The body of Christ is given, taken, and eaten in the supper only after a heavenly and spiritual manner. And the mean whereby the body of Christ is received and eaten in the supper is faith. So the, the, uh, the real presence, obviously, in Anglicanism is a spiritual presence. It's real, but it's spiritual. And uh, the Third Anna Articles clearly reject transubstantiation. Uh, but as you say, rightly, there are some Anglicans who embrace that and say you can do that. Um, and I think that's frustrating, first of all, from just a sort of creedal dogmatics perspective, right? Like, what is it that we believe as Anglicans? I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I can't pin it down. Uh, and then second, this person who suggested to me that I could be Anglican and still hold to transubstantiation, uh, I was like, that's not the point, right? The point is not I want to be able to believe what I want to believe. The point is that I want to be in a communion in which 
everyone believes that. That's right. And then, and then, like the naysayer would say, which is totally fair. Uh, you know, look at that Pew survey, right? Like twenty five percent of Catholics actually believe that. <laughs> uh, but it's not. It's not so much, I guess, about uh, whether or not all the people believe perfectly as they should. But what, like, what is the universal teaching of the church, right? And on that point, the Catholic Church uh, succeeds. Right, and you know, it's been said by by wiser people than I that to be to to be a Protestant is essentially to be your own pope. And there's a, there's a funny kind of way in which that expresses itself in Anglicanism, where you can say, I'm Catholic. You can even say, I recognize the authority of the Pope. Uh, but in a way, you're kind of putting yourself in authority over him, right? You, you, are, you are in a sense like being the Pope, saying, I want this guy to be my Pope, even though I'm not in the fullness of communion with him. Right. Um, to me, it just it just became one kind of mind game after another yeah, to justify to staying it. out of communion. You know, to yeah. me, it was just a, a joyful surrender. I mean, it was just a moment to say, thank you, Lord, that I don't have to be in charge of my own, you know, my own dogmatic program anymore, which may or may not intersect with the teachings of the Catholic Church. Yeah, that's that's really well said. How about any other sort of difficulties that you had coming in? I, I, and I like the phrase of, Newman, right, where he says, you know, 10,000 difficulties make not one doubt, right? right. So to, to, to have a difficulty with a doctrine is not to doubt a doctrine, per se. Um, so, I mean, I, I certainly can sort of list off a number of difficulties that I had and had to work through before becoming Catholic, but what were some of them for you? I didn't have doctrinal difficulties, per se. Uh, it, it wasn't that I understood necessarily all of right. the doctrines that I was signing up to. Sure. Um, you know, there were certain things like indulgences, for example, that I I had I honestly just they just weren't really that sort of thing wasn't really on my mind around yeah. the time that we were coming into the Catholic Church. But it was actually kind of fun to to discover the way that works in the Catholic Church and to kind of think, wow, yeah, that that would indulgences. I mean, that's sort of an absurd idea for a lot of Protestants. Um, but well, especially once, when you, as a Protestant, you know, well, all oh, yeah. the of the abuses. Oh, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, Johann sure. Tetzel and all that. And so, yeah, it really is just a repugnant idea to most Protestants, including myself once upon a time. Sure. And and even, you know, even as a as somebody who had already come into the Catholic Church, you know, I, I could still say to myself, yeah, I can kind of see why people would think that's weird and why that would be sure. a point of controversy or whatever. But, yeah. you know, it was still it was something that I could sort of joyfully explore. And that's a big idea I share with with people who are thinking about coming into the church that, you have the whole rest of your life, God willing, um, if God grants you many years, to explore all the riches in all these different treasure chests of doctrine, of, of worship, of, of life, of parish life, you know, all these kinds of things. Um, and I'm still just, just enjoying those riches, you know, because back in, back in Anglicanism, we were, we were very strict on this idea of, as you were articulating before, of essentials and then adiaphora, right? There's this whole category of thing that we use this Greek term adiaphora, you know, all these like sort of extra things, which you're welcome to believe, but you don't have right. to. To me, it's just so much more enjoyable, so much richer a life to be in the Catholic Church where, where the church says to us, yeah, all this stuff is what we believe. I mean, there may be times in your life when you're sort of, you know, kind of more interested in this than in that or whatever. But I mean, there's nothing particularly optional. I mean, it's 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 just all there and it's all for you. En enjoy it. Make use of it. Uh, live yeah. into it. Yeah, that is nice. I, I have heard Protestants, though, criticize converts like you and me because we just sort of gave up our, our freedom of thought. We, we gave up our, we gave up the hard work of discerning, right? And uh, that's a, that's a misunderstanding, I think, for a couple of reasons. One, just sort of submitting to the authority of the church, if indeed it is Christ church, is not the same thing as being lazy or just giving up your own discernment. And second, there are plenty of things that the church has not dogmatically defined, right? So I think, for example, of uh, you know the debate between Bonyesianism and Molinism, and you know how God's predestination interacts with our free will, right? That's not dogmatically defined, and you can be a Catholic and be a Bonyesian or a Molinist, right? Yeah. So. Um, as, as just one very specific example of, of things that you can still sort of discern and pray through. Now, maybe the church will define in the future, and if so, uh, I will gladly submit to her judgment one way or the other on that specific topic. But you know, until then, there are plenty of ways that we can exercise our theological muscles and, and try to discern um, and pray through plenty of issues. Yeah, I mean, to me, there's so much more freedom within the, the, the doctrinal boundaries of the Catholic right. Church. I mean, when, when you're sort of trying to just 
uh, you know, uh, make sense and form your opinion individually about every single thing. I mean, it can just be so it can be crushing to your soul. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're just you just sure. don't know where to go. You kind of almost shut down. At least I did. Yeah, no, totally. I think that's a, a reasonable thing to do. Uh, you mentioned, you know, how you were considering sort of being in this in, in staying staying put and having this sort of ecumenical ministry. Uh, that's another thing that was suggested to me as well. And more particularly, the person who said this to me said, your your clan, your tribe, your family is a Protestant family, and you should just stay there and do the Protestant thing because that's what you do. And you can help to, you know, work towards ecumenical unity, et cetera, but your clan is Protestant, so you should remain Protestant. And I thought that, I thought that argument was sort of ridiculous on its face. I think it's it's your argument is a better one, right? That my ministry as an Anglican cleric is to sort of be a bridge, right? And I can sort of help heal these divides. I can be a bridge as the via media, right? The middle way. I can be a bridge between these sort of more, uh, these less traditional expressions of Protestantism and the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church, et cetera. Um, but in your conversion, did you contemplate the Orthodox Church? Was that a was that a factor in your mind, or was it always a, a draw to the Catholic Church? I certainly did contemplate the Orthodox Church, especially several years before I became very serious about the Roman Catholic Church. It, okay. And and I have found that a lot of Anglicans, um, they sort of use the Orthodox Church as a as a release valve for yes. staying Anglican, because you're able to, especially if you subscribe to something like a branch theory of Catholicism, which mm -hmm. is. I think you have to subscribe to a view like that if you want to consider yourself both a Catholic and, and can you ex Anglican. Can you explain that for, for listeners or viewers? Sure. Well, the branch theory, you know, says something like there, there is, there is a, a thing called the Catholic Church, but it, it can, to kind of co-opt the, the language of Vatican II, it can subsist in different, uh, in different bodies, right. um, all of which have wounds in them. Uh, that's like something like uh, what Michael Ramsey will later say uh, in the Anglican context. So you can be Roman Catholic or you can be Anglican or you can be Orthodox and maybe one or two other things. But maybe Lutheran, maybe yeah. maybe Lutheran. You know, it sort of depends on again, though, it depends. On, it's like, well, who's defining what <laughs> yeah, the totally. marks of Catholicism are? Right. 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 Um, so it becomes pretty murky pretty quickly. But um, but. The, the idea in particular that the Orthodox are out there, that there's this, this group of Christians who believe in bishops, who believe in sacraments, all these sorts of things, but they don't subscribe to the, the supremacy of the Pope. Mm -hmm. That is something that I think a lot of Anglicans take a certain comfort from. Yeah. And I've known a lot of Anglicans who then have kind of thrown themselves into like Orthodox spirituality and that sort of thing, and, and even tried to kind of like articulate that for Anglicans, you know, to say like, well, you know, sure. Catholics yeah. pray... Roman Catholics pray the rosary, we can pray the Jesus prayer, or we can, you know, sort of things like that. Yeah. I, I, however, ultimately just came to believe that it, it really did all come down to the ministry of the Pope. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I, some may disagree with me, but I mean, my, my appreciation of, of the Church Fathers um, ultimately led me back to, to really believing that the, the ministry of the Pope was intended for the Church from the beginning. Um, so it wasn't some kind of like perversion that that or, or some kind of innovation that came into the church later on, which might be something that some Orthodox might say and would probably be something that a lot of Anglicans would say. No, but rather as um, as Lumen Gentium, the Vatican II document says that that the church subsists in the Catholic Church, in the Roman Catholic Church um, under the ministry of the Pope. And, you know, when, once once those kinds of pieces start to come together, then you know, my appreciation of orthodoxy and my appreciation of my own Anglican past doesn't go away. It's all still yeah. there, but I just have to understand how all of that, you know, fits into this, this larger picture of, of the one church that is under right. the authority of the Pope. Yeah, I appreciate how you articulate that it really all comes down to the authority of the Pope. And for listeners or viewers who want to learn more about that, I highly recommend Joe Heschmeyer's book, Pope Peter. It's a new one. It came out last year, uh, but I interviewed him on the podcast, Andrew, to talk about his book and the scriptural arguments uh, and arguments from tradition for the authority of the Pope. And it's really, really good. Um, but I also, I want to sort of pull the thread a little bit more on the branch theory idea uh, as Catholics, we subscribe to um, to what we might call sort of the the lung theory, right? And uh, the lung theory says that there are two lungs of the church, and that's the Catholic and the Orthodox uh, churches, and that's that's from John Paul II himself, sure. yeah. uh, because they both enjoy valid apostolic succession that has continued to this day. They have a valid priesthood, uh, valid bishops, 
and all the all the same sacraments, right? So, um, so John Paul II described the Eastern churches as basically the the Eastern lung of the church. But the problem, as you just mentioned, is that they don't subscribe to the supremacy of the Roman pontiff. They subscribe to the primacy of the Roman pontiff, so there's no denying among the Orthodox that he is first among equals, but they do say that he's first among equals, rather than having some sort of universal um, universal authority over the entire church. Right. Um, and so we are in impaired communion with them. We're in broken communion with the Orthodox Church. But we are in communion in the sense that we recognize that their communion is the same communion as ours. It is the valid body and blood of Jesus Christ. Um, but on this, on this, so, this that, so that's sort of the lung theory, right? We don't recognize that the Anglicans are in communion with us. We don't recognize that, uh, you know, they're, they're in impaired communion in the sense that all of our Protestant brethren are. But they don't have the valid sacraments. They have valid baptism, uh, but they don't have the valid Eucharist right. um, or any of the other, uh, other five. Um, but on this this topic of sort of um, the branch theory, or are we all really under the same Big Ten? Can we see all these things as just different expressions of the same Christianity? Uh, I have a, a an Anglican friend who actually was in Oxford with me, uh, and he would go to Pusey House, which, as you'll recall, is a, a, sort of the high church Anglican, right? Sure. So he his high, his tendencies were high church already. But I would ask him, why aren't you become Catholic? What's you know you're you're so close and yet so far. Uh, which, by the way, has been my experience with a lot of Anglicans. They're, you know, uh, so close and yet so far in the sense that they're so close to our theology on a lot of different topics, but they're so far precisely because they're so close. Yes. So they don't they don't see the need to become Catholic all the way. They sort of see themselves as, as positioning, uh, holding a unique position in the via media, maybe in that ecumenical ministry that you talked about, et cetera. So anyway, my friend was a great example of that. And what he told me was, I'm too Catholic to be Catholic. And I was like, well, that's very, it's a very strange way of thinking about it. But what he was saying is, I think too highly of how I share communion with all of these Christians to join a church that denies communion for all those who are not in visible, perfect communion with her. So I think that argument fails for a number of reasons, but I'm sure it's one that you've heard before. Uh, so what do you think about that argument? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost a kind of more mysterious understanding of the church than yeah. the church teaches. Um, it, it's ultimately an appeal to a theoretical church, to yeah. to an you know to the reality of an church, invisible yeah. church, right? Yeah. Um, that then has different kind of visible manifestations. But um, but the the Catholic Church, you know, and and uh, you know the fathers articulate it this way. It, it, it isn't in. I mean, it's invisible in a sense, but it's also visible. I mean, that the invisible church and the visible church are 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 together. And of course there's wheat and tares. Of course there are people who, you know, come along to church and even receive sacraments and that sort of thing who, to whom the Lord will say, you know, depart from me. I never knew you. I mean, of course, of course. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean that the visible church is just a kind of like, well, you know, a kind of like practice church or something like that. Like, you know, that there are these sort of, you know, ways of kind of being Christians on earth, but really it'll all be some other completely different kind of thing one day. And we don't, we don't understand the invisible nature of it. So yeah, I used to, I used to think that way. And I certainly had friends who, yeah, who, who kind of believed that it was a kind of more Catholic thing to do not to become a Roman Catholic. I, I just eventually felt like, um, again, it was a theoretical religion. It, it just it wasn't yeah. real enough. And for a church that believed that when you come to Mass, you really receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, you really need to know that you're in the right place. Yeah. Um, which, you know, for, for all of the problems that the Roman Catholic Church has, uh, it just became undeniable to me that, that that's where that reality was found. Yeah, no, I, it's, that's a great answer. I love that. Um, when you became Catholic, did you think about trying to pursue ordination within the ordinariate, or do you attend an Anglican ordinary parish now, or are you are you attending a you know TLM or Novus Ordo parish? What's been your path since then, and how is your discernment about the Anglican ordinariate ministry like? Well, we were received into an ordinary diocesan parish into a, a, an ordinary diocese. Um, we decided on that for a number of reasons. The main one was that there was no ordinary community where we lived at the time. In yeah, Tennessee. they're few and far between. I mean, I, I wish there was one here where we are, but there isn't. It's just it's hard to find them. So they, if, they, if you have one in your area, listeners, uh, check it out for sure. Yeah, and and I hope to see more and more of them develop. I think they're they're really wonderful communities for sure. Uh, when we moved to Texas, when I took up my position at Word on Fire, 
we were able to start attending an ordinary parish, although it's pretty far from where we live on kind of the other side of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Oh, okay. we, we make an effort most Sundays to drive down there uh, to attend um, the ordinary. And in fact, we are now members of the ordinary. We, we oh, decided great. to yeah. go ahead and, you know, change over completely. And we yeah. decided to do that because the ordinary, we discovered, is for us. It's for, it's for me. It's for my wife and my children. I mean, it's for people like us. Um, and if you want to get a, a vision of what that, of, of who it's for, first of all, and then what its mission is beyond the main, the, the, the first people it was formed for, it's great to go and read Anglicanorum Chaetibus, which is the, the document that began the ordinariates back in 2009. The, the opening paragraphs of that, by the way, are just a wonderful, concise articulation of what the church teaches about herself, like what the mm -hmm. church is, actually. Um, it's a wonderful kind of place to just find that stuff uh, laid out concisely. So we we love being a part of the ordinariate. We we also go to Novus Ordo uh, masses uh, here and there because it, they just are a little bit closer and more convenient sure, to yeah. our home. Uh, so we do that from time to time. But uh, yeah, we love we love being able to worship with so much of the kind of same familiar stuff that we were blessed with as Anglicans before we became Roman Roman Catholics and. We love being able to kind of share our gifts now with our Catholic friends. I mean, all, all the people that I work with in my office are just, you know, for the most part, ordinary diocesan Catholics. And it's just right. wonderful to get to talk to them. And, you know, some of them come along with us sometimes to the ordinariate uh, on, oh, on nice. Sundays. Cool. So it's really fun. You know, on the question of discernment and ordination and that sort of thing, um, as far as I know, the doors are uh, remain open uh, for mm. continued discernment on, on sure. that question. But for the time being, anyway... I, uh, I'm really enjoying uh, life as a layman, as uh, a full-time evangelist and, and writer and speaker. And um, there's you know just a lot of uh, great stuff that I get to do as part of Bishop Robert Barron's ministry. Um, to be honest with you, it's sort of everything that I enjoyed about being an Anglican cleric without yeah. a lot of the stuff I didn't enjoy. Yeah, um, sure. So at the time being, I'm, I'm just, just delighted to be serving the Lord uh, in, the, in the way that I, I am right now. Well, that's great. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Sure. So I, I know you're, you're an author as well, not just in the sense that you write articles at various places, including Word on Fire. You're a, a fellow of the Word on Fire Institute focusing on popular culture. But you've also written a book. So maybe let's talk about the Word on Fire at work. But first, I want to talk about this book of yours that you've written. It's called Truth Matters, Knowing God and Yourself. Uh, when did you write this? Was this a pre was this a pre conversion book? Um, and why did you write this? Yeah, it, it was a pre conversion book. I, I certainly encourage everybody to get a copy of it and read it. Uh, but I have a funny relationship with the book in certain respects because sure, it I is imagine, yeah. a book that I was writing as I was and and definitely a book that I was completing as I was very much in the throes of this crisis of whether I was supposed to become Roman Catholic. Yeah. So, and it's written for an evangelical publishing house who um, gave me a book contract because they realized that among evangelicals, there's a, this burgeoning idea that doctrine matters more, that yeah. liturgy matters more, that there, you know, um, that beauty matters more, that there are all these sorts of things that are sort of mattering more and more to evangelicals. And so um, the, this publishing house, New Growth Press, gave me a contract and, and they were, you know, it was a wonderful, wonderful arrangement. Uh, that I got to write this book uh, for them. But as I discovered, as I'm writing a book about truth, that the truth of Christ in the Catholic Church just just preyed upon me more and more and more. And so by the time I finished the book, I, I couldn't, um, you know, I couldn't basically finish the book saying, you know, actually, I think everybody ought to just go and become Roman Catholic because I wasn't right. quite there yeah. at that moment. And plus, you and the know, publishing house wouldn't be happy with you if you were. They so. weren't going to be happy with it. Exactly. <laughs> so I was trying to write a book that was, you know, kind of in the vein of the the vision of being a Christian that C.S. Lewis articulates in Mere Christianity. Sure. You know, that, yeah. you know, this sort of this idea of what are the basics? Uh, what are the things that are kind of life giving from the tradition that everybody who calls himself or herself a Christian really needs to to embrace? So that's kind of where that book came from. And uh, if you were re to read it today, you would find certain things that you might go, oh, that's not maybe not quite the way that I would see that uh, phrased in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. But I, I hope very much that you wouldn't find anything in there that is completely repugnant to Roman yeah, Catholic sure. doctrine. But you're not going to find me appealing ultimately to, you know, repenting and returning to the authority of the Pope, <laughs> <Right>. um, unfortunately. <laughs> 
Um, Makes sense. But, well, is, the, is there a follow-on book in the works where you, you sort of round out the story and tell the rest of it? There's not presently. I, I, I you know, that, that book is kind of just sitting on my shelf as I, as I wonder eventually how to do some kind of follow-up to it. At the moment, I'm so busy writing about culture stuff and um, working on various projects about film and, uh, and faith and uh, all, all kinds of other projects that uh, in some ways that the, the idea of coming back around and, and maybe revising that book or writing a, a companion volume to it has, has, uh, has had to wait. But I, I think at some point uh, I will, I'll come back to it. Sounds good. Yeah. You add, it, add it to the long list of uh, things to do. There's never enough time and always so many good ideas. Indeed. So. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit more about your work at Word on Fire then. You're, you're the fellow of popular culture at the Word on Fire Institute. Um, tell my listeners and viewers, first of all, what the Word on Fire Institute is, you know, how they can become members if they'd like to be. And then tell me a little bit about some of the work that you've been doing there as, a, as the pop culture guru. Well, the Word on Fire Institute is a wonderful uh, endeavor that we're, uh, that we're engaged in here. Part of Bishop Barron's overall vision of his ministry as an evangelist, uh, as a Catholic evangelist, is forming more evangelists. Like not just leaving that work up to the bishops and the priests, although they right. need to be obviously more evangelistic and mission oriented um, all the time, which I think uh, for the lar- for in large part they are. But we also need to like continue to grow into this this vision of of um, this universal call to holiness, which is a, a big piece of what Vatican II teaches. But for various reasons, a lot of Catholic lay people have just continued to want to leave that work to the professionals, when in fact, we know that that work is everybody's work to do. So a big piece of what we're doing at the Institute is um, trying to form people through courses that we have inside of our Institute, um, access to other resources, increasingly things like conferences and and Mm -hmm. in-person events, communities, um, resources for parishes, all kinds of stuff. We really just want to continue to equip the church building upon Bishop Barron's ministry. So yeah, you can, you can join. We have rates for membership. I can't remember off the top of my head what they are, but uh, you can become a member. You can just check us out through your search engine, Word on Fire Institute, and, uh, and you can join the Institute. But we also produce a lot of other things that are just available to everyone, whether they're Institute members or not. And um, one of the things that I've been getting to do lately is not only do a lot of writing, but also some filming for projects that we're doing that are going to be public facing that that everybody will have access to um, in the coming months and in the years ahead, including a theological film commentary series, which I filmed last month, and uh, they should be available on YouTube this fall. Um, and then another series in the works for next year and other things besides. So, you know, it, it's just uh, just kind of a dream job, really, to, to get to come to work every day and to get to do theology, but also to get to engage with, with cultural stuff and, and just sort of, you know, what's going on in the world and how does the church need to, to be involved in that. I've got a great group of colleagues here who, who have different specialties like education and apologetics and um, uh, just you know, family life, parish life, all kinds of different things going on here. So, you know, uh, good times uh, ahead for us at, at Word on Fire, and, and we hope that we can be a blessing to to the whole church. Yeah, it's been exciting to watch the Word on Fire vision and ministry just expand, uh, even over the past you know three or four years. Um, certainly since I became Catholic six years ago, it's just it's it's really it's a flourishing ministry, and it's been cool to to behold. And I'm great. I'm really happy that you're plugged in there, uh, and I've appreciated some of your work. Um, and, uh, you know, it might be funny. Some people think, why do they have a fellow of popular culture? Right. But you're, you're not like the, you're not going on and like posting TikToks, right. It's not that kind of pop culture. It's, uh, right. it's, 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 it's art, right. It's, it's, um, it's film, uh, cinema, music, uh, things like that. It's these, these, you know, the, the, the life of the people, right. Popular culture. Right. And it's very it much is, in the vein of what Bishop Barron has always done. I mean, yeah. you know, when I was still Anglican, I was drawn to Bishop Barron's YouTube videos where he did yeah. his own film commentaries and music commentaries. Well, I was and- just watching one uh, the other day. In fact, I, I sent this to um, to Larry Chap. I told you that Larry and I do a monthly conversation. And Larry's a big Coen Brothers fan, but he's never seen a serious man. And so I uh, sent him you know, a recommendation to watch a serious man. And then I included with it a 2009 video from Bishop Barron where Bishop Barron's talking about the serious man. Uh, yeah. and giving his commentary on it. And that's that's a fantastic film, by the way. Love it. Uh, and Bishop Barron's commentary is great. Yeah, and, you know, Bishop Barron, as uh, as a bishop now, you know, he made a lot more of that sort of thing as Father Barron, and he still mm-hmm. does it a lot as Bishop Barron, but it's it's just wonderful now that as his 
ministry as a bishop, you know, continues to keep him very busy and he's writing all the time and speaking and doing, doing so many things that, um, that I get to be involved in, in some of those things that he's always done also yeah. that, that, uh, um, that, that I get to comment on films and, and all of that sort of thing. And, and as you say, it's not just, we, we, we're not just trying to embrace the spirit of the age. Um, we, we're, we're not, right. we're, we're very, very carefully curating the things that we want to talk about and the things that we want to point people in the direction of. Um, I'm a big believer in the fact that in some respects, we don't have a popular culture anymore. We, we have, you know, we, we still kind of believe in this, this mid 20th century idea where, you know, we all have a lot in common and it's just a question of sort of identifying those those things that everybody knows about. Well, nowadays, it's not really like that. I mean, it, there are all kinds of different cultures, not just one popular culture. And so, you know, we have an opportunity to kind of say, well, you know, we're we're involved in in various different cultures. We're we're kind of dipping our toes into all kinds of different things that are going on. But we also want to kind of evangelize for culture itself to say that there are things that we ought to, you know, that we ought to embrace beautiful things, wonderful things um, that uh, that people can certainly find inspiration from and be drawn into the church, but also are just sort of good for everybody. Yeah, there's a, I like your point about various cultures and that's, that rings true for me, but I also think there's a really strong popular anti-culture yes. in existence today. Uh, and, you know, we could, we can talk about that probably maybe, maybe at length on another on another discussion of sort of what I mean by anti-culture, but my wife and I have been watching Ted Lasso. I don't know if you've seen that. Oh yes. Um, and so there's this one, one footballer, one guy on the team named Danny, uh, who's from a Latin American country. Uh, I don't know which one, but he, he always says football is life. Right. And that's sort of his, his mantra. And the first episode he's, he's heavily involved in the first episode of the second season and has to sort of recover that sort of culture idea, culture meaning life. Right. Um, and so, so for him though, he looks at these things that are going around him and he sees life and he sees beauty in them and he, he gets vitality from them. I think too many, too many of us today look around and just see, you know, nothing but death and despair. Uh, and so that's what, that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at with an anti-culture. There's, uh, rather than a, a desire to, rather than an impulse to make beautiful things and recognize life as beautiful as it is, uh, and make it more so. We sometimes, I think, just sink into despair and, and fail to see the beauty and the vitality of the world around us, uh, and that gives rise to an anti-culture. Uh, so, so you have your work cut out for you, I guess is what I'm saying. Well, I, I certainly do, and it's an, it, it is an awesome responsibility, but so far, a lot of fun. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, uh, so I want to take an opportunity just to tease briefly kind of what you and I have been cooking up for the coming fall. Um, and so I, this is the first time that my listeners and viewers have, have seen or heard of this. Uh, but I, I'm putting together with uh, Josh Goldman, a collaborator of mine, uh, a, a new podcast that's going to be talking about various films, uh, one season at a time, one director at a time. And so season one, we're going to be probably looking at the work of Christopher Nolan. And Andrew, you have uh, agreed to come on board for that and, and help us break down a variety of Nolan films and, and look at all of the various uh, themes throughout. And so uh, we'll be releasing that sometime this fall. And I'm really excited to have you aboard, Andrew. It'll be fun. Well, thanks, Zach. I I'm thrilled to be joining you. And uh, it's uh, it's great to actually maybe model for the world good conversations about wonderful things and beautiful things. You know, this is I grew up this way, like talking to my cousins and my friends and stuff about yeah. movies that we loved and, and albums that we loved and that sort of thing. And there was a real spiritual connection in that. So, yeah, I think that Christopher Nolan's films are so rich and so valuable for uh, Christians and non-Christians alike. But I think especially for us as Catholics, there's there's really fertile ground there to explore together. So I appreciate your inviting me into that project. Yeah, for sure. No, I'm super excited. I've been, uh, just the past couple of nights, I've been watching um, Tenet, the newest Nolan film. Yeah. And it is just, it's remarkable. And it's just, just a reminder. I mean, I was telling my wife as we were watching it last night, I don't think there's anyone else today who could make this film. This is, this is just like Nolan through and through. This is a Hallmark Nolan you're watching it thinking, what in the world is going on? You, you see like the geometric lines that he likes to employ and sort of a, a lot of the sort of dark, dark uh, gray hues throughout. It's just, it's just quintessential Nolan and I'm loving it. So uh, I'm really excited for our, our future conversations this fall. So more to come on that for, uh, for viewers and listeners. Great. Uh, before I let you go, uh, I know we're at the 45 minute mark, so we're almost out of time, but I did want to ask you about mayor of East town because I saw you, um, actually I watched it at your recommendation. I, I saw your, uh, your article about this at the word on fire 
and thought, oh, this sounds like a show that I should check out. So my wife and I watched it, and it was phenomenal. I mean, it was it was dark, it was depressing, um, it was gut wrenching, but it was also real. That's the word I would use, I think, to describe it. it was real, and so we we get glimpses of, um, you know, it takes place in a uh, in a western Philadelphia suburb called East Town, confusingly, uh, and. Uh, you know, we get glimpses of people whose lives have been upturned by opioid addiction, uh, by, uh, you know, divorce, by loss of siblings, loss of sons, um, uh, loss of children. And it's, it's a really just gut-wrenching examination, I think, of the human condition. Uh, but I watched it on your recommendation, so I wanted to, uh, to ask you a little bit more about what you thought and why you think people should see it. And if people go from here and turn it on, what should they be looking for and thinking about? Yeah. Well, I think Mayor of Easttown is definitely one of the better shows that we've had in in recent times. There, there are a lot I of agree, good shows. Yeah, yeah but I, I think that the the it's very timely, as you say, because it touches on you know a lot of brokenness that we're kind of dealing with in the world today. It also deals with with racial things and with like mm -hmm. um, men women things. I mean, just all kinds of stuff that's going on in that show. Um, for me, though, and I, I need to be careful how I talk about this because I don't want. I don't want people to get the wrong idea, but this is kind of part of what I do in my work is I think that the main character in the show, Mare, played by Kate Winslet, is really a kind of Mary figure. Mm -hmm. um, and now by saying that, again, I'm not talking necessarily about the, the fullness of Mary's sure, yeah. grace and virtue and, and all of that sort of thing. But it is really compelling to see a female character on a show who has this kind of like maternal role uh, who is kind of like the mother of the town. I mean, she, she, she kind of bears the burdens of people in her town. She cares for them in this loving way as a police officer, interestingly. And we find out in the show that she's lost her son herself and that she sort of like Mary kind of like bears this like deep wound. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this sort of sword has pierced her the heart. Right? Matter, yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's from that woundedness that she is able to be a healer. Uh, now, she has all kinds of problems of her own, and she makes a lot of mistakes, um, mistakes, obviously, that our Blessed Mother did not make, would not make, that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. But there's something, I think, really compelling about the show, ultimately, about, you know, imagining um, imagining that kind of care that, that has a shape of holiness about it. Um, now, it's also been pointed out by, by people that, that, it, that Mayor's... Um, Mayor's role in the community is interesting because it also demonstrates the lack of male, like sort of good men in that community, which mm -hmm. is something that we have to think about. That that is is obviously the case in so many of our communities and our families and all of that sort of thing. But it doesn't need to be either or. You know, the the story of Mayor uh, doesn't have to be a kind of indictment of the the lack of good men. It it can be the the raising up of this this female character who has this special sort of caring role in her community. Yeah, I, I really, I was impressed by the film. Uh, I thought it was good. And, you know, standard disclaimers apply. It's an HBO show, so there are some grisly scenes and everything. It's not it's not a show for children, certainly. Um, but I, I agree with you, Andrew. It's, it's a, a show that explores some really profound themes, and it does so in a really, uh, a really visceral um, but moving way. So I yeah. think it's a great, I think it's a great, uh, great series to watch. And I, I highly recommend it. Um, yeah, I think, I think, uh, I, I guess the only qu other question I have for you, and maybe this is a longer discussion, uh, and I think we'll probably get into some of these discussions in the fall as well, but, you know, you point out that Mary, that Mayor in Mayor of Easttown is a type of Mary. And the theological principle here that, it, that also goes in scriptural exegesis applies that a type is never greater than the thing it represents, right? And so you're, you're, you're certainly not, uh, comparing Mayor and Mary in that sense, but you're saying that there are elements of, there, there are sort of Marian dimensions to Mayor's identity here, right? Um, but when when a director or a screenplay writer includes these elements, do you think it's always conscious? Is the is the screenplay writer thinking I'm going to use some like elements of Christian tradition here, and I'm going to sort of make make my Mayor into a Marian figure, or do you think this is uh, this is something that's almost you know an expression of the human heart? These eternal laws that are written on our hearts that that people even unconsciously can recognize the fundamental truths of what we hold as Catholics and that those things make their way into art. And yeah. then maybe it's not an either or, right? Maybe it's a sort of a bit of both here and there, and it obviously depends on the situation. There are some directors and screenplay writers who clearly are much more intentional about uh, doing those themes, but uh, I guess the question is, can it be unintentional? Yes, I think it can be unintentional. 
it's always hard to know unless the the director or the writer just comes right out and says this is what i meant or this is right. what i didn't mean i right. think in the case of mayor of east town i think some of it must be intentional though because the church features in the show i mean there i mean even though well the it, final it, episode is called sacrament right and, indeed right and yeah. and i mean the the you know not to not to give spoilers here but i mean yeah the the, the final episode features the whole town gathered in a church yeah. Now, the way the church is depicted is kind of funny in the series. Like you have this yeah. permanent deacon who seems to be <laughs> sort of he seems to be celibate to be and priest. live in the rectory and yeah. you know and all of this sort of thing. So, you know, they didn't get all of their their facts straight. But clearly they the, the writers and the director have have in mind some some overt stuff about Catholicism. There's just no yeah. no question about that, right? But in other shows, you know, yeah, you mentioned Ted Lasso. I mean, I think in some respects, Ted is a kind of Christ figure in certain mm -hmm. respects. I mean, he is somebody who is um, selfless to a fault. He he always seems to like bring out the best in people. He he always he finds just the right way to kind of clearly demonstrate that he wants the good of the other that's in his yep. midst, right? But the show to me seems to be it, it really does seem to me that the writers are kind of oblivious to the to the yeah. Christian. <laughs> yeah. um, the Christians, uh, you know, sort of sensibility that that right. that carries. So yeah, I mean, I think I think we still live in a Christ haunted world to some degree. Uh, I think it's interesting that some of the the best things that we'll be watching, some of the most important pieces of art, um, some of the most popular things, even things like Ted Lasso, are going to have those undertones. Yeah. Whereas more nihilistic things are maybe going to kind of get the applause of the critics, but are probably not going to catch on. That tends to be the way that I sort of survey the landscape of, yeah. and that, that may change. Um, things are things are grim in certain respects, but yeah, I do think that that that's a, a very important thing that we can do as kind of as Catholics who are interested in culture is to to keep pointing to those things, things like Ted Lasso or whatever, and say, aha, yeah. now, now there's something there that I right. wanna I wanna connect for you. No, I, I uh, appreciate you saying that. And Christ Haunted is a reference to Flannery O'Connor, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Who referred to the South as Christ Haunted. And Flannery is one of my absolute favorites. Just one of the, yeah, just one of the greatest writers of all time, I think. Um, I, uh, I actually wrote a piece. I submitted it for publication to the New York Times, who of course rejected it. But I, I referenced Flannery O'Connor's Christ Haunted line there. Uh, maybe I'll send that piece when we're done here. Yeah. Um, but but here's, here's why I think it matters. And let me close by saying this, and then I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to, to sort of respond to this. But here's why what you just said I think really matters. Ted Lasso, let's take that as a representative example. The writers on the show have no idea, presumably, have no idea that they're incorporating these Christian themes, have no idea that they're making their main character, who's a, who's a funny, affable, really warm-hearted, lovable guy, into a Christ figure. They have no idea. I, we don't think, right? We, we can pretty safely presume that they're oblivious to that. Uh, but that figure is really compelling. Ted Lasso is a hit show for a reason, because that Christ-like figure at the center of it is really, really compelling and helps people get excited about <laughs> about reality, right? I mean, f football is life, right? In the words of uh, Danny, the footballer who I mentioned earlier. Uh, and the reason that that matters is because people can get excited about Christianity and about Christian themes, even if they don't exactly or explicitly sort of recognize the lines paralleling those. And so your work as a fellow in popular, cult fellow in popular cultural culture at Word on Fire and really the whole broader work of Word on Fire, the whole broader work of the new evangelization, let's, let's cast the net even wider, is about doing that, is about helping people recognize what's going on here, is about helping people see the truth of Christianity and get excited about Jesus Christ uh, and the church, which is his expression here on earth. So that's why it all matters, but I'll let you respond to that, that real quick. Yeah, I mean, we don't live in Christendom anymore. There is no yeah. Christendom, and we can't coerce people into becoming Christians. We can't, you know, we, we can't, you know, we, we, we can only we can only um, we can only sort of try to highlight the, the compelling nature of the gospel itself, which which right. we believe it is. We believe that it is so profound and powerful and life giving that it's irresistible to those who really look at it seriously. And so, yeah, we need to kind of go all the way back to this this biblical strategy, uh, to be honest, that certainly the new evangelization talks about of you know, sowing and also reaping these seeds of the word uh, that, you know, that, that, that these seeds that have been maybe unwittingly scattered uh, in the culture, that yeah. we're able to cultivate those and then sort of help bring those to harvest for people to be able to see the truth of the faith. Now, I mean, is it all going to be, 
easy or are we going to see, you know, mass conversions or whatever? Maybe not. I mean, this is a this is a weird and difficult time for the church. There's no doubt about it. And it might get worse before it gets better. But who cares? You know, mm-hmm. who cares? We we do the work and we leave the we leave the growth to God, believing that, yeah. you know, that what we do will not will not go into the void. The Holy Spirit gives the increase, right? Yeah. Um, well, thanks, Andrew. I uh, really appreciate the time today. I think this was a great discussion. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to our future discussions about films this fall. So to my listeners, stay tuned for that. Uh, we'll be doing the new podcast, as I mentioned, focusing on the work of Christopher Nolan. And Andrew will be joining me for those conversations. So I'm super excited uh, to get to work on those. And we'll be releasing those later this fall. If you want to follow Andrew's work, go to um, andrewpettiprin.com, which is his website. Or just go to the Word on Fire Institute, and you can read a bunch of things that he's written there. And then he mentioned he's got the forthcoming YouTube videos, kind of film theological commentaries uh, this fall as well. So stay tuned for those. And I will link to uh, to Anglicanorum Chetibus, which is the Anglican Ordinary document that Andrew described earlier. Uh, and I'll link to Mayor of Easttown as well, if that sounds interesting to you. Uh, and I'll also link to uh, to Andrew's website and uh, his profile on Word on Fire and book and all of that good stuff. But Andrew... Thanks so much for joining me today. Really appreciate the conversation, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks, Zach. And to my listeners, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Creedle. If you have a question for Andrew, uh, feel free to reach out to me, and I'd be happy to pass that along to, to you, Andrew. So send me a note, Zach, at CredalPodcast.com. Any other thoughts, comments, uh, gripes, concerns, complaints, uh, send them along my way as well, Zach, at CredalPodcast.com. And until next time, God bless you.